Welcome to this presentation of the El Marisol Hotel and Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens through vintage postcards and photographs. My name is George Sampanis and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara's past. In my previous presentations, we looked in detail at two of Santa Barbara's magnificent hotels, the Arlington and the Potter. The Arlington opened its doors in 1876 and it closed in 1925 after sustaining major damage from the earthquake that year. The lavish Potter Hotel opened its doors in 1903 and burned to the ground in 1921. The next chart will compare the timeline for the Arlington, the Potter, and the El Mirasol Hotels. The timeline shows the lifespan of the hotels. Note the El Mirasol was in business for 52 years compared to the Arlington, 49, and the Potter, less than 20. Our story begins several years earlier. In 1864, the Herder brothers, Gustav and Christian, German immigrants, established an upholstery business in a New York City warehouse. The firm grew to become world-renowned for its quality, detailed and exquisite cabinetry, and tasteful interior decorating. Their furnishings, decorative panels, flooring, carpentry, and draperies decorated the estates of many of the Gilded Age's tycoons, ranging from A to V, the Astors to the Vanderbilts, from the East to the West, as well as in the White House in Washington, D.C. Examples of their work are seen here and on the following page. Pictured are two Steinway pianos showing the detailed and elegant craftsmanship work of the Herder brothers. In 1904, the Herder brothers firm purchased an entire city block consisting of 4.6 acres in downtown Santa Barbara. The parcel was bounded on the east by Garden Street, on the west by Santa Barbara Street, the north by Arriaga, and the south by Michel Terena. The site is now beautiful Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens. In that year, Christian Herder's widow, Mary Miles Herder, came to Santa Barbara. As many before her, she fell in love with Santa Barbara's setting, its climate, its lifestyle, and decided to make Santa Barbara her new home. She commissioned the architectural firm of Delano and Aldrich to design a bungalow on the site. The result is shown here. This is a postcard view of Mrs. Herder's finished, quote, bungalow as it faces Michel Terena Street. The beautiful home was built of stone and brick and then covered with plaster. In 1909, Mary's artist son, Albert Herder, and his artist wife, Adele, arrived in Santa Barbara to help Mary decorate her bungalow. They were well suited for the job, having just opened Herder Looms in New York, a continuation of sorts of the family business that had closed in 1906. Artwork and furniture created by his father Christian and artwork and furnishings created by Albert and Adele transformed the El Mirasol into a showcase of Herder art. El Mirasol in Spanish means the sunflower. This motif was used on wallpaper, metalwork, and lighting fixtures in many of the rooms. The art throughout the mansion was diverse and as one described it, exquisite. Each is a masterpiece of its kind. On the left is a beautiful sunflower themed lantern which graced the exterior of the main entrance to the home and to the right a more detailed image 
If you look towards the bottom right, you will see the sunflower lantern circled in this very early view of the El Marisol. And here is a much later postcard view with the lantern highlighted above the main entrance. A few examples of the Herta Looms tapestries and wall coverings that Albert and Adele used in decorating El Marisol. The Herder and Tiffany families had a long relationship which continued with their sons Albert Herder and Louis Comfort Tiffany. Shown here is one of the 12 Herder Lions stained glass windows. They were designed by Albert Herder and crafted by Louis Comfort Tiffany. The arch top stained glass windows were jeweled and hung over interior double doors and featured two lion heads. Albert's artistic talents were broad and diverse. He painted in oils and watercolors. He painted portraits and sometimes in the Impressionist style. His fine art graced the walls of the family estate. Shown here are two of four of Albert's mural paintings which hang in the Supreme Court Room of the Wisconsin State Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin. The first depicts the signing of the Magna Carta. He inserted his son Christian holding onto the dog collar in the foreground. Christian grew up to become governor of Massachusetts and then served as Secretary of State in the Eisenhower administration. The second mural depicts Augustus Caesar listening to the pleas under Roman law. Each mural is nine feet by 18 and a half feet long. The next few slides will show a few more examples of Albert's art. Mary died in 1913, leaving the estate to her son Albert and his wife Adele. They decided to renovate the residence and turn it into a lavish hotel. Extensions were added to the wings. Fifteen bungalows were built and elegantly furnished. The interior of the main building was updated with unique artistry. As shown in this illustration, it was transformed into a luxury hotel one year later. A Marisol Hotel advertising brochure claimed it to be the hotel of choice for those, quote, who dislike the publicity, the noise, and the promiscuity of a large hotel. There will be no band, no ill-mannered and indifferent bellboys, no obligatory tipping at every turn to ensure attention, end quote. Instead, guests were assured of cordiality, comfort, cheerfulness, and quiet surroundings. A San Francisco newspaper, the San Francisco Newsletter, in 1917 published an article on the hotel which stated, since opening three years ago, it has housed more people of social and financial prominence, not only from New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and other cities, but from Europe as well, than any other hotel of equal size in the United States.
many of Almirasol's guests arrived in their lavish private rail cars, similar to the one shown here. They stayed for a month or two each year. Among the famous guests were the J.P. Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the Crockers, the Rockefellers, the Guggenheims, and the Armors. In later years, the Joseph Kennedys, Admiral Richard Byrd, Charles Lindbergh, and Cary Grant. It seems one of these wealthy guests borrowed, shall we say, this room key and chain for room number 46 pictured here. Notice the sunflower motif on the right. The original mansion was beautifully landscaped. Albert added gardens and new landscaping to accentuate the beauty of the hotel's main building as well as each of the 15 new cottages. This postcard view attests to the perfect blending of flora and architecture. Guests that arrived by train were met by an attendant in a private automobile and chauffeured to the El Mirasol, a quiet oasis in the middle of the city. Once the guests settle into the hotel, Korean houseboys would serve them dressed in blue silk mandarin coats by day and bright orange jackets in the evening. In the center of an arcaded patio bordering the courtyard stood a fountain shown here and an imported tile pool shown on the next postcard view. Hospitable service was the rule of the day. There were two servants available to attend to the needs of each guest. This view captures the simplicity, the elegance, and perfect harmony blending the reflecting pool, the exotic gardens, and the Tiffany window facade into a perfect postcard. The hotel and bungalows offered elegant accommodations and much, much more. There was a library, a card room, a drawing room, and a tea room. This postcard shows a perfect spot for solitude and rest where one might enjoy some quiet time. This is a lovely hand-tinted postcard view of the veranda which is part of the main building. Another hand-tinted postcard view of the gardens, the pool, and the vine-draped pergola. For those of you who are not familiar with the term hand-tinted, it means just that. The original photograph was black and white, and artists were employed to hand-paint or hand-tint the scene in color. Guests who chose to stay in a bungalow had a choice of a five-room, three-bath cottage or a four-room, two-bath cottage, both with fireplaces and roomy closets. Each room had a private entrance and each bungalow a covered veranda. This postcard view displays the flowers, trees, and vines accenting and draping the bungalows, or villas as they were sometimes called. It is a serene scene of beauty and continuity. In this beautiful postcard view, you can see on the left a charming bungalow and on the right a portion of the main building. And one final hand-tinted postcard view before we go inside to do a little bit of exploring. Shown in this postcard image is a corner of the peacock room. The room 
was decorated in bright orange and blue, the hotel colors, causing one visitor to remark, how few would have used such color, yet how marvelous the result. Frank Lloyd Wright, the world famous architect, upon visiting El Mirasol, entered the cactus room and said, Madam, that is the most beautiful wall covering in the world. It featured an American desert landscape painted on individual tea wrappers which encircled the room. The herders selected Chinese silver foil tea wrappers and highlighted them with gold leaf. This gave the landscaping a richness of depth well before the invention of 3D. El Mirasol had two formal dining rooms, one of which is shown here. Let's take a moment and look at the two menus for the 5th January 1937. The first for lunch and the second for dinner. The menu on the left is orange and the menu on the right is outlined in orange. The china was orange and blue, all in keeping with the orange and blue theme throughout the hotel. Twenty-three years later, in 1960, the price of a lobster cocktail was 85 cents. A Chateaubriand for two, with French fries, onion rings, rolls and coffee, ten dollars, or a broiled filet mignon with fresh mushroom cap sauce, ranch potatoes, tossed salad greens with dressing, and for dessert, a strawberry sundae topped with a cup of coffee for a whopping price of $5. As you can see, the use of glass surrounded the Persian room. The large leaded glass atrium and the colorful Herder Tiffany stained glass windows reflected the Santa Barbara sunlight in a changing array of rainbow colors. I can just picture myself sitting in a soft, comfortable leather chair for hours as the color spectacle danced for my pleasure. I quote from the book Santa Barbara and Montecito Past and Present as described in the Santa Barbara County Archives of 1920. El Mirasol, the Sunflower, is one of the most perfectly appointed hotels of its kind in America today. It is designed for those who desire rest and quiet, who want to live as though at home without the responsibility and fatigue of keeping house, but who dislike the publicity, the noise, and the promiscuity of a large hotel. Here, people live in their own bungalows, which are so designed as to be readily adapted to any arrangement of suite desired, from a single room and bath to an entire bungalow with sitting room and bedrooms complete. Each room with its own private entrance opening directly out of doors. The main building a beautiful adaption of the mission style of architecture surrounds a patio with fountain in the center, being thus charmingly reminiscent of early Spanish days. To the rear of this is El Marisol's private park, surrounded by bungalows, beyond which one has a superb view of the Santa Inez Mountains and intervening foothills. The whole forming a picture of restfulness and charm hard to duplicate even in California outside of Santa Barbara. El Mirasol is not for the sick, chronic invalids being positively not accepted. The intent is to provide a home for a limited number of those who are lovers of sunshine, natural beauty, and real comfort, and to such it offers in its surroundings, appointments and service, 
a place absolutely unique in the hotel history of the world. End quote. The herders entertained and hosted many community and cultural events at Marisol. Artists and poets throughout the world stayed at the hotel. Tea was served every day from 4 to 6 p.m. In 1920, the herders sold El Marisol to Frederick Clift. Clift was also the owner of the Clift Hotel on Geary and Taylor Streets in San Francisco. Henry S. Kinsell, Frederick Clift's son-in-law, was the resident manager of the hotel and lived in one of the bungalows. He and his wife Grace had a son, Clift S. Kinsell, who was raised in and around the hotel. That young man grew up to be the well-known and respected doctor of pediatrics, who all Santa Barbarans know as Cy Kinsell. During my research for this presentation, I found no mention of any damage done to the hotel from the 1925 earthquake. However, I did come across this interesting story. The manager of El Marisol, Charles Wilson, donated one of the villas for use by the telegraph employees. The telegraph was the only means of communication with the outside world at the time and he drove them to and from work every day during the emergency. One of the telegraph operators was Edwin Matthews. His son, Ed Matthews, became a famous baseball player during the 1950s and 60s. Here he is shown on the cover of the first issue of Sports Illustrated magazine. The Hall of Famer grew up in Santa Barbara and graduated Santa Barbara High School in 1949. The city honored him in 1996 by naming the Santa Barbara High School baseball field Eddie Matthews Field. Looking at this image, I find it regrettable that the interior postcard views are in black and white or sepia. So we can only imagine how lovely it must have been in color. After World War II, the hotel changed ownership several times and started a trend that was to become all too common. In 1963, Morgan Flagg owned the aging hotel. The El Marisol had become worn and ragged. Most of the guests now were permanent elderly patrons. Two years later, in 1965, Flagg traded the hotel to Jacob Seldowitz for his ranch in Costa Linda. Within six months of Seldowitz's purchase, two successive fires destroyed the entire attic of the West Wing. The hotel had quickly come full circle. To borrow a phrase from Hattie Beresford's noticious article, the El Marisol had gone from a swan to an albatross. Seldowitz proposed rebuilding the hotel as a nine-story complex with an auditorium and performing arts center. Fortunately, his request for a necessary zoning change was denied. Then, a group of businessmen and community leaders acquired the property and proposed an 11-story condominium complex. Thus began a three-year battle with Pearl Chase spearheading opposition to any and all high-rise proposals in Santa Barbara. Several other projects were proposed but failed to win approval. Soon, the once elegant El Marisol Hotel was bulldozed to the ground. The Museum of Art acquired the property 
to build a new museum, but these plans fizzled. Then, a community garden was tried, and that too failed. Although the community garden concept failed here in the 1970s, it did give rise to several others that have now taken root in Santa Barbara. The once beautiful 4.6 acre show place became overrun with weeds. Trees were untrimmed, some fallen, and an abandoned automobile and a homeless encampment became an embarrassment to the city as well as a disgusting eyesore to the public. Then, in December 1975, an anonymous donor purchased the site and gave it to the city to be used as a park. The anonymous donor secretly hired Grant Castleberg to design the gardens. She reviewed and approved his plans as he progressed. Two years later, after her death in 1975, the mysterious donor was revealed to be Alice Keck Park, the daughter of William Myron Keck, founder of Superior Oil. She married David E. Park, a Montecito gentleman who died three years after their marriage. Some think the name of the garden is Alice Kex Park. So, by way of clarification, her name again is Alice Keck Park. Alice's life reads like a Hollywood soap opera, but that's a story for another day. For now, let us just sit back and enjoy the beautiful photographs of some of the garden's highlights. <music> 